seven. Warnings of falling away or apostasy in the New Testament. In order to understand the concept of falling away from the faith, or which is called apostasia or, or departure from the Lord, we need to understand the paradigms that the New Testament employs to describe this great gift of salvation. We could accurately state that there are two primary understandings in the New Testament for salvation per se, or two perspectives. The four Gospels are harmonious, but they are written from different perspectives. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what are called the synoptic from the Greek word synoptikos, or the same view. They're very easily harmonized. They present a Jewish understanding from a standpoint of fulfillment of the Old Testament, whereas John is a very different perspective, not inharmonious, but complementary, and provides a mysterial, mystical understanding of the gospel. We could literally state then that you have a Jewish and a Gentile approach to the truth. They're not contradictory, but complementary. The church has understood the Gospels uh, from this perspective of Revelation chapter 4. On the gilding of every uh, altar gospel, we have typically the four beasts of Revelation, which picture the four Gospels. This comes from Revelation chapter 4, which I'll quote to you. John has a vision of heaven, and he says in chapter 4, verse 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now notice verse 7. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the lion, Matthew, the ox, Mark, the man, Luke. The fourth is the flying eagle, John. It's a heavenly perspective. And that's why it has issues like predestination, issues of election, issues of the mysteries of the gospel, uh, the Eucharist, and other things which are reserved really for the spiritually mature. And thus, we are here today, as I give this lecture to you as you prepare for baptism. You no doubt have seen wonderful things in the scriptures, and some seem contradictory. But as you prepare for this marriage to the Lord, it's important to remember the covenant obligation. And so we'll look briefly at salvation from this covenantal obligation sense. Let's go back to Genesis. So, in the initial catechesis, I said God called out and to be a priest, and we were meant to commune with God, to submit to his kingship. As Psalm 8, 8 says, all things were put under his feet. And Adam forfeited this. He relates his people back to himself by his covenant. This is the first point. God's people are related to him by covenant. It's a marriage contract of sorts. In Exodus 19, the covenant is made. In 20, the Decalogue is read. And there's a means of restoration, which would be the sacrifices in the Levitical priesthood. When they disobeyed the Lord by presumptuous sin, there was usually no remedy for the covenant. When they committed sins of ignorance, there was. Apostasy, then, is leaving the terms of the covenant. Literally, apostasia, it's leaving, apo, 
Stasia, leaving your position, literally stepping out or departing, walking away from the Lord. Um, in the New Testament, an apostasion is a bill of divorcement. So this idea is not some newfangled one. This is an expression of consistent biblical truth. That's the first point we need to remember about the covenant. The second is this. There are two types of sins. All sin is sickness, but some sins lead to death and others do not. Some are spiritual sniffles and some are gangrini, as St. Paul calls it. In the Torah, we find two types of covenant violations, presumptuous sins and sins of ignorance. We see this in Leviticus. Presumptuous sins and ignorance. Presumptuous sins could not be forgiven. Take David, for instance. He says in Psalm 50, Had you desired sacrifice, I would have offered it, but you will not be pleased with sacrifices. David committed adultery, and there was technically no forgiveness for him. And this is the context of Romans chapter 4, 1 through 6, which uh, says, uh, what should we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertained to the flesh, hath found, uh, etc., etc.? Then in verse 5, he says, uh, But to him that worketh not, but, but, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. David had committed adultery and was outside of God's covenant, and he had no grounds for forgiveness. And he lost his justification in this context. And after his repentance and confession to Nathan, it was restored. This is recorded in Psalm 32, where he says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Verse 2, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. Now notice this, And in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, why is that important? Verse 3, when I kept silence, my bones wax old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Uh, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Notice that David was not forgiven until he confessed. And this is the context of Paul's statement about blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. Every high priest taken from among men, the scripture says, is ordained for men and things pertaining to God, that they may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Hebrews 5.1 A priest was meant to offer for two things. Compassion on the ignorant and on those that are out of the way. In other words, presumptuous sins and sins of ignorance. We all commit sins every day. That's why we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We're not Pelagians, we cannot save ourselves, but we're also not Calvinists, which deems that every action is sinful. Now Hebrews 5, let's recount that. The priest can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, right? So that's sins of ignorance, and then the next, and on them that are out of the way, presumptuous. Um, because th this is very important to catch. Notice the second phrase, them that are out of the way. Re restoration to walking in the way of the Lord was considered salvation. And that's the biblical context of what it means to be a sinner, is somebody who is out of the way. James talks about this. So James says at the end of his letter, he says, Brethren, if any one of you do err from the truth, in other words, are out of the way. The Greek word there is plani, where you get the word planet, planitis. It's to, planao is I wander, I'm a wandering sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray, wandered. 
restoration to the Lord is when we stop wandering and we're following the Lord and his commandments. That's the second point to remember. So number one, we're related to him by covenant. Number two, there are covenant violations, breaking of the relationship with the Lord. But then the third thing that we need to remember, and this is what we what really truly makes it a new covenant, is the provisos to restore that covenant were temporary. When the children of Israel violated God's covenant, they were restored by going to the priest and offering the ordained sacrifice. And according to Hebrews chapter 10, it offered a temporary forgiveness. It was not permanent. Now with the coming of the new and greater mediator for a new and better covenant which was established upon better promises, the Lord, the high priest over his own house, he introduces better promises and then a better means of administration. The law is no longer written within graven stones but written upon the tables of the heart, Second Corinthians chapter 3. But then also there's spiritual sacrifices. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I, I, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is universally interpreted by the Orthodox Church as liturgy. The Old Testament sacrifices were ineffectual and could not renew the inner man. Liturgy, when it is offered in the spirit and in the heart of a man, when we say, Anos comentas cardias, let us lift up our hearts, there is an actual change within the person, and it's not just in the letter, but it's in the spirit. And the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And that's why we say that the Mysteries, the Eucharist, are life-giving. They imbue us with God's life. Now, with those three distinctions in mind, let's look now to the New Testament understanding of inheritance. Is salvation an inheritance, as we're proposing here, or is this just orthodox tradition and twisting of Scripture? Well, let's let the scripture speak for itself and let the word of God himself, O Theologos, the true theologian, Jesus, tell us. So in Matthew 19, 16, we read the pericope, the excerpt of the rich young ruler who came to him. And it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? 17, And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. 19. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 20. The young man saith unto him, All these have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. 24. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Salvation is an inheritance. And 
in order for that rich young ruler to have that inheritance, he had to surrender to the Lord and, as Jesus said, sell all that he has and follow Jesus. In other words, be sold out for the Lord, submit to him, lock, stock, and barrel, and God gives you the kingdom. But this young man did not want to give up his possessions, for in his heart he was an idolater. And the greatest thing, the greatest commandment, is what he broke. Now, this is sometimes objected to by Baptists. Baptists will state there's a difference between salvation and inheritance or reward, but that's unbiblical. It's unfounded. It's unbiblical. It is a presupposition, and they do not allow the text to speak for itself. So comparing Scripture with Scripture, we learn that the inheriting the kingdom is the same as inheriting everlasting life. It's their own wicked private interpretation. It's wicked because it deceives people. And Paul specifically warned, he said, let no man deceive you by any means. For because of these things, in other words, the sins against the covenant, God's wrath comes on the children of disobedience. So if I seem like I'm a little worked up about this, it's because Paul was worked up about it. And there's nothing worse than telling somebody that they don't have cancer when they do have cancer. Now, to reiterate this point that salvation is inheritance and is eternal life, I quote to you the parallel passage in Mark chapter 10. And in 10.17 it says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now in the passage in Matthew it says, What shall I do that I may have eternal life? Inheriting eternal life and having eternal life, inheriting and having, it's identical. And that's the point of the two Gospels writing it slightly different. It is an inheritance that we obtain at the second coming. Verse 18, And Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that is God. And he lists the commandments in verse 19. In verse 20, he says he kept them all. Verse 21, Jesus said that the man went away sorrowful, and he wasn't going to enter in. Then he says to his disciples in 23, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? The disciples were astonished, couldn't think that they could enter into the kingdom. And of course, that's the natural feeling we have when we hear about the requirements of the kingdom is that, man, I can't get saved, or I'll never be saved. And and that's the attitude that we should hold in humility is, um, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. So my point is, is allow scripture to speak for itself. Don't just reject it because it's difficult or doesn't make sense to you and stick with what the Christian church has always taught. Now, the remember, the old covenant could not give eternal blessings, but the giving of the Spirit after Pentecost secured this for God's people. So they no longer wait for the promise, but we have received it in part, and we receive it in full at the second coming. Now, with these things in mind, let us look at, in the next section, the warning passages. What disinherits us from God's kingdom? May God bless us and keep us, and may we abide in him.